Good morning, and our first reading is book Isaiah, chapter 5, verses 1 to 7. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I am going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and the braes and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel, and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. And he looked for justice, but so bloodshed, for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. And our second reading is book John, chapter 15, verses 1 to 17. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me, And I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from the me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burnt. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands, and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you Friends, for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I choose you and appointed you so that you might go and be a fruit, fruit that will last. And it is so that whatever you ask in my father, in my name, the father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Let's pray. Gracious, most merciful God, we thank you for your kindness to us. And we pray now that you would open your word to us, open it to our hearts, and our hearts to your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As you well know, Uh, By now, whenever I preach from the New Testament, I have a tandem Old Testament passage 
And when I preach from the Old Testament, I have a tandem New Testament passage. Um, Some of you find it difficult to see the link between the two. Uh, That's all right. Uh, Sometimes I find it hard in retrospect to think what I was thinking of when I, why did I choose that passage? But I think today's link is pretty obvious. It's both about vines and vineyards and fruitfulness and fruitlessness. We're in the middle of a, well we're not actually, we're at the end of a sermon series on the I am statements of the Lord Jesus in the book of John. I am the good shepherd, I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, I am the resurrection and the life, the way, the truth and the life, I am the true vine. Uh, Next week we Uh, enter into Lent, that period of 40 days before Easter, and I had originally planned to do a series on Psalms, but I thought I was having so much fun in the Gospel of John that I've decided to stay in the Gospel of John for the next six or seven weeks. And people who had conversations with Jesus. So we're going to start with a man at midnight, Nicodemus, who came and saw Jesus in chapter 3. A woman at midday, chapter 4, the Samaritan woman, lounging by the pool, chapter 5, the uh, man who is crippled. And then the woman caught in the act, chapter 8, an extravagant worship, Mary pouring out the perfume on Jesus. And then Jesus' conversation with Pilate, And then the resurrection encounters with Mary Magdalene and seven men in a boat. So that's your menu for the next seven weeks, just in case you wondered whether there was any thought that goes into these sermons or not. uh, Yes, I do now have a license to bore uh, for for a whole year. So that's where we're going uh, over the next few weeks. Now, before I continue with, um, uh, yes, next slide please, yes, before I continue with the theme of the vine, we have to do a spot of biology. Now for the medical students among you, this will be very familiar, at least I hope it'll be very familiar to you. Um, If you're uh, an eighth grade student, you've probably studied this as well. In the trunk of a tree or a plant, there are channels called xylem and phloem. And these are channels of nutrients going up from the roots to the shoots and coming down from the leaves to the roots. There's a two-way communication constantly going on. Now, I know fully well that Jesus did not mean this in exactly this scientific form when he was talking about it 2,000 years ago. And neither did his disciples understand it in that way. But we're here and we do understand how channels of communication go up and down the stems of the plant. So I just want to mention that at the beginning. I will come back to it very shortly. Now this passage may sound very repetitive, Jesus uses the word remain 11 times. He uses the word love countless times. So I've I've chosen to put the, the themes together. So these are my three points for you for this sermon. Chosen, cleaned, connected, and those are the preconditions for a crop. Okay? Chosen, cleaned, and connected. But first of all, I have to take you back to Isaiah chapter 5, where Isaiah the prophet, about 800 years before Jesus, sings the song of the vineyard. God is talking about having brought his people out of Egypt and planted them 
in a vineyard. He's cleared the stones away, he's built a wall, he's made a wine press, he's looking for fruit. Looking for fruit. God looks for fruit in our lives. The Old Testament concept of the offering of the first fruits. When John the Baptist came preaching, he preached a baptism of repentance and he said, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Jesus talks about this um, uh, idea of God looking for fruit in, in John 15 here. I am the true vine, my father is the gardener. It, it's to my father's glory that you bear much fruit. And in the Synoptic Gospels, that's Matthew, Mark and Luke, he tells the story of the parable of the tenants, where the owner of the vineyard comes looking for fruit. Then, of course, in Revelation 22, the tree of life, which is for the healing of the nations, bears its fruit each uh, month. So God is looking for fruit, but he was sorely disappointed in Isaiah chapter 5. And it says, Israel is the vineyard. Israel is the vine. The people of Israel are what God has planted in the land, in the soil of the Holy Land, and he's looking for fruit, and all he found was injustice, violence. So when Jesus then says to his disciples, I am the true vine, I am the true vine, he is saying, I am the true Israel. I am the true Israel. It is, an, again, an audacious claim. Well, let's look at these three points, chosen, cleaned, and connected. Uh, the chosen bit comes from verse uh, 16. It's almost the last verse we read. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love one another. Chosen. This doctrine of being chosen is one of the most offensive doctrines of the Christian church because it removes from us our pride. I've made a decision for Christ. Well, no, I haven't really. I've simply agreed with the choice that he made of me before the foundation of the world. God is always the initiator. He is the creator. He was before all things. He knows all things. He is prior to all things. God is the initiator. We are the respondents. I had no choice. My parents did not consult me about my conception. They did not stop to ask my permission. I had nothing to do with the decision-making process of my life. And the news is that you have nothing to do with the decision-making process of your new life. You have been chosen. Jesus says, I chose you, you did not choose me. Jesus says to the disciples, follow me. In 1985, I, Lucy and I went to visit the Holy Land. As we landed in Tel Aviv Airport, we were taken onto a bus, as is always the case, and in front of the bus there was a jeep, and flashing on the back of the jeep was, follow me, follow me, follow me. We had bought the tickets, we had made the flight, but when we got there, follow me, follow me. 
God is always the initiator. We are not the initiators, we are the respondents. I am not the reference point of my life, and you're not the reference point of yours either. God is. So I may think I've made a decision for Christ, but all I'm doing is affirming God's decision for me. It may appear that I've committed my life to Christ, but all I've done is accept that Christ has committed his life to me. We come to our senses like the prodigal son. We head home and we find the father is already waiting for us. He has already made the first steps. He has known us from before our conception. He knitted us in our mother's wombs. He knew all our days before there were any of them written. We're not chosen by merit, but by grace. Loved not because we deserve it, but because of his divine delight. Jesus said, I chose you, you did not choose me. So much for chosen, cleaned or pruned. It's the same word to clean a vine or to prune a vine. It's the word from which we get catharsis, to clean. In John 15 verse 2 it says, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes catharai, so that it will be even more fruitful. And Jesus goes on in verse 3, you are already clean, katharoi, because of the word I have spoken to you. The word I have spoken to you, the cutting word of God, is even able to make us more fruitful. The vine dresser, the gardener, prunes. Prunes that which is fruitful. There is a fallacy around in the world of uncontrolled church growth. The vine dresser prunes, cuts back. There are some churches which are so big, have grown out of control, where people can only spectate and are fruitless. In the medical world, we call this neoplasia. Huge churches where only spectating is possible and not bearing fruit. Connected. Verse, well, verse 4, 5, 6, 7, 9 and 10. Connected. <clears throat> Eight or nine times Jesus says, remain in me, remain in the vine, Remain in me, remain in me, remain in me. Remain in my love, remain in my love. Do you think he's trying to tell us something? In older versions you may have it, abide in me, dwell in me, live in me. We've been blessed in Christ, we've been chosen in Christ, he describes us as the faithful in Christ, but what does it mean to remain in God's love, to remain in Christ? We go back to our xylem and our phloem. Two-way communication from the fruit to the root, from the root to the fruit. The sap flows both ways. Remain in me, this two-way communication. And remaining in Jesus means open and clear communication in both directions. In verse 7 it says, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. God speaks to us through his word. We speak to God through prayer. Do you see in verse 7 how these are put together? My words remain in you. 
Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My word remains in you and you ask. The word of God speaks to us and we speak to God in prayer. That is remaining in Christ. Two-way communication. And so this is to my Father's glory, says the Lord Jesus, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. What is the fruit in our lives that brings glory to God the Father? It's when we're like the Lord Jesus. I've said this before, I won't get tired of saying it, I get such a kick out of when people say to me, I've met your son, he is so like you. God the Father gets such a kick when people realise that we are like his son. What is his son like? Well, he's bearing the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. These are the fruit of the Spirit. This is the fruit of that is being looked for. In John 15, verse 9, we read this, As the Father has loved me, so I've loved you. Now remain in my love. The next verse, If you keep my commands, you'll remain in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. My command is this, that you love one another as I've loved you, verse 12. And again in verse 17, love each other. Love, 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 and love. Agape, self-sacrificial love. This is undeserved kindness. And God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that God loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. God is always the initiator. God is the one who loves, we love in response. God is the one who commits to us, we commit back to him. God is the one who chooses us, and we agree with his choice. This is how God loves. This is how Jesus loves. This is how we should love. But it can only be produced by the sap of the Holy Spirit rising within us. You can't get up in the morning and say, I'm going to be loving today. Because it'll last just as long as the porridge is burnt or as the coffee boils over or as your temper boils over and then Jesus says in verse 11 I've told you all this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete what is the joy of the Lord Jesus? What is the joy of the Lord Jesus? What is the joy of heaven? Jesus said there's more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that repents than over 99 that are already in the fold. What is the joy of the Lord Jesus? It was for the joy that was set before him that he endured the cross, despising the shame. It was for the joy that was set before him. What is his joy? What does he pray for? He prays that we may behold his glory. I'm going to prepare a place for you so that where I am you can be also. Father, let them be where I am, beholding my glory. This is the joy that was set before the Lord Jesus that enabled him to endure the cross. We need an eternal perspective to maintain 
our joy, because otherwise our momentary and light afflictions will overwhelm us, will overpower us. We're going to see the Lord Jesus and to behold his glory, the glory he had with the Father before the foundation of the world, the glory of him casting galaxies into space, of putting the red berry on the woodpecker, of painting the dots on the ladybug, the glory that he had with the Father before the foundation of the world. This was the joy that enabled him to go to the cross. And he went to the cross and bore our sins so that we might bear fruit. He went to the cross and died our death so that we might live. He went to the cross to prepare a place for us with the Father. He went to the cross and entered the grave, destroyed its power so our joy might be complete. Let us get an eternal perspective so that we do not lose our joy. And where love and joy come together, peace is not far away. You'll find it in the verses just immediately prior where Jesus says, peace I leave with you, peace I give you. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. Peace and love and joy, the fruit of the Spirit. But none of this can we generate on our own. Only by the indwelling, the remaining, the abiding of the Holy Spirit in us. He does abide in us and we abide in him. Just as Christ abides in the Father and the Father in him. And as we are connected chosen, cleaned, we produce this crop of fruit. It is the family likeness. All of these metaphors that Jesus uses are agricultural. There's sheep and shepherds. There's vines and fruit. There's fields with wheat and weeds. There's, well, it's not agricultural, but it's fishing. There's a net with good fish and bad fish. And all of those things involve separation. Separation of weeds and wheat. Separation of good food, good, good crop and bad crop. Separation of sheep from goats. Separation of um, good fish from bad fish. There has to be judgment. And where there is judgment with a living God, there has to be salvation. And where there is salvation, there has to be worship. And that is what we were made for, to worship him. But it came at great cost to Jesus freely given to us, but at great cost to Jesus. He says, greater love has no man than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. The physical pain, the emotional shame, the public humiliation, and the mockery that goes with crucifixion with a cost of the Lord Jesus. And with the cost, there comes consequences of ignoring him. If you do not remain in me, verse 6, you're like a branch that is thrown away and withers, and such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. Do not ignore such great a salvation how can we possibly be saved if we ignore so great and costly a salvation? If there were any other way, he would not have had to go to the cross, but he went to the cross for us. So do not ignore 
the Lord's invitation to you, the Father's invitation to you in Christ. He can call you out of your tomb like Lazarus. Come out! He can call you out of your boat. Follow me! He can call you out of your tax office. Levi, leave it. Follow me. He can call you out of your hiding place up a tree. Zacchaeus, come down. Come and follow me, says Jesus. Do not ignore the invitation. Allow him to clean you up. Hear him say, go and wash after he's spat in your eye. One of these days I'm going to do a sermon series, series entitled The Insults of Jesus. But that's for another day. But hear him say, go and wash. Hear him say, unbind him and set him free. Hear Jesus say, leave her alone, she's done something beautiful for me. Hear him say, where are your accusers? Hear him say, you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Do not ignore his invitation. Allow him to clean you up. Get connected. He has spoken. This is the source code. It's freeware. Access it. Read it. There's some really neat stuff in here. And speak to him in prayer. Because as his word abides in you, so you learn to ask what is for his Father's glory. Anything. Not the new Mercedes S-Class. Not for your own glory and benefit, but for the Father's glory. And let him produce a crop of fruit in you. The fruit you so long for love and joy and peace and let him satisfy your every longing. Let us all glorify the Father by abiding, remaining, being in Christ, filled with his Holy Spirit. And before I finish, let me take you to a later verse in Isaiah, chapter 27 where it says this. In that day they'll sing about a fruitful vineyard. I, the Lord, watch over it. I water it continually. <clears throat> In days to come, Jacob will take root. Israel will bud and blossom and fill all the world with fruit. Jesus is the true vine. We are the branches. It is to the Father's glory that we bear much fruit. Let it be so. Amen. Hallelujah. What a Saviour. Gracious and most merciful God, we thank you for your kindness. We thank you for your cutting kindness, for your pruning in our lives, for the things that you cut out. Lord, come prune me, prune us. Lord, we want to bear more fruit. Lord, by your gracious Holy Spirit, let your sap rise within us so that we may bear fruit, the likeness of Christ for your glory, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We have two songs, which will flow from one into the other, so please stand and let's sing.